Well, good morning, everyone. Don't you love this orchestra when they get to play with us? Would you thank them one more time for, for playing this morning to start off our service? Well, we're excited about the beautiful day outside and the incredible things that are gonna happen in here. And we're gonna be filled with joy and we're gonna begin with a song, There's How Joy in the House of the Lord. You'll remember it if you don't know it, but you probably know it. So how about standing together, smile on your face, let's sing it. the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds a victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be
Find someone you've not said hello to. We've got some guests with us this morning. Tell them you're glad they're here, and we'll get started in just about 30 seconds. Awesome. If you'll have your seat, and then if you'll take a, give your attention to our baptistry, we get to celebrate baptism this morning. Pastor? firing away. Okay, there he goes. All right. Baptism is always an awesome time to celebrate the truth of the goodness of the gospel, a picture of Jesus' death and resurrection for us. We're going to celebrate that this morning, but we're adding to that such a beautiful picture of gospel friendship. Frank McCardle is coming this morning to uh, identify with our church fellowship through baptism. He's been following Christ for a long time, and one of the reasons he's been following Christ is, is because he's had good uh, friends uh, in Jesus Christ. And it's a picture, uh, uh, very often, uh, from the uh, Gospel of Luke, when those friends bring their friend to Jesus, a friend who's struggling, a friend who's lost his way, who needs help. Uh, and it was their faith uh, that brought about healing, uh, and it was uh, that friendship that brought about that man's forgiveness in Luke's Gospel. And that's this picture today. Um, uh, Edwin Dale is uh, Frank's friend, and... Uh, He's been a, played a crucial role in discipling and encouraging Frank as he's grown in the Lord. And sometimes friends uh, need help all the time. And so today, Frank, because he's bad a little back issue, actually it's not a little back issue, it's a big back issue. And so uh, we thought two is better than one. Uh, and so in just a moment, uh, two friends are going to help their friend uh, take a, a step of obedience and baptism. Uh, and uh, we're so thankful. I'm so thankful for the godly friends that God has put in my life. And so another cool dynamic here is Frank is from Baton Rouge. He has good friends named Tim and Lynn Tullis. Tim and Lynn are on the front row there, Tim. Lynn, y'all uh, wave. Their children were in my youth group back when I was in Baton Rouge. And now uh, their son Tyler is a church planter and pastor in Boston, uh, doing great work in that great city. So it's just so cool how gospel friendships connect us and, and uh uh, more is unfolding than we could ever imagine in our lives together and those friendships last into eternity. And so, Frank, we celebrate uh, what God has done uh, in your life today. Do you believe that Jesus died and rose again for you? I do. And do you desire to, uh, to follow after Jesus Christ dying every day? I do. And do you desire to join this body of believers as we make Christ known in the world? Absolutely. And in just a moment, we're going to baptize you. Uh, but we want uh, uh, your friend to take an opportunity to give a quick word. Frank McCardle is a dear friend. He and his wife, Gabe, have been friends for a number of years. Frank has been in my Bible class for 15 years. And he came in with not a great deal of Bible knowledge, but he did, he did read. But he became the best student that I had in my class. So I am so proud to stand by him in love today as he, he makes his confession. Yeah. Yeah. So this church gives me the privilege of baptizing you, my brother. church. My name is Kevin. I'm your children and family pastor. We want to welcome you to our worship services this morning. We especially want to welcome the eighth grade um, group from First Baptist Church Covington. Did I get that correct? Is that right? I got something right today, right? It's going to be a good day. 
We're so thankful that you're here worshiping with us today. Thank you for coming along with your leadership. Thank you for being a part of our worship today. Um, for those of you who are visiting with us today, we also want to welcome you to our fellowship. Thank you for um, coming and being a part of our worship today. Uh, we want to recognize um, your attendance today. The way you can do that is text the word welcome to the number that you'll see on the screen, or you can look in front of you. There's a little card with a blue stripe on the top. It's a connect card, and you can grab that and do it the old-fashioned way. Fill that out sometime during the service, and as you exit the sanctuary today, drop it in the offering plate. We would really appreciate getting a record of your attendance. And also, if you're a visitor, on your way out of the building today in the commons area, make your way to one of our welcome desks where Pastor Sean and Pastor Rob will be waiting, and they have a free gift that they want to give to you. Again, we are thrilled to be able to worship with you today. If we stopped right now from what we just saw, it would be a great day of worship, but we're in anticipation of what Jesus Christ is going to continue to do as we worship together as a First Fairhope family. Again, thank you for worshiping with us. Would you join me now as we go to our Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house and to worship you. Father, the mere fact that you gave us a breath to breathe and a heart to beat today is proof that you are not finished with us yet. And it's also proof that there is a world, Father, that is lost and that needs us to be the hands and feet of Christ. Father, thank you that as we've entered into this place today, we know that because your word will be opened, that we will be forever changed. Continue to grow us into your likeness as we worship you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you, Pastor Kevin. You know, we're getting ready to, we're in the middle of this series that the pastor's leading us through on foundations, and, and I believe that one of our foundations is God's faithfulness. When we're, things are going fabulous, we can see God's hands at work. But when we're going through the storm, we can still, if you've walked with the Lord at all, you can still see his hand, even in the storm. Yet for some reason, we get to those points in time where everything begins to get dark and out of our control, and we think, is God gonna fail us? Well, his promise is that he won't. We're gonna sing together a great hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, just really mostly your voices, very little instrumentation. And let's just fill this room with this great hymn and let it wash over you as we take strides towards the throne room this morning. So would you please stand as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God my Father. I don't often find myself in Lamentations, but this morning in Lamentations, the third chapter at the 22nd verse, it says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen? Let's sing that chorus. Great is thy faithfulness.
Let's pray together. Father, you are so good. And we thank you, Lord, that your promises never fail. And that, Father, as believers, when we come through and we see your hand at work, we're so grateful. And, Father, when there's times where we look for you and we have to look for you, we know that you're going to be there because, promise you, you, Lord, you've promised through your faithfulness in good times and bad. So, Father, for people across this room today that may be going through a valley, I pray, God, that you show your faithfulness to them today. And, Father, for those that are just rejoicing and phenomenal things happening in their life, I pray, God, that again, once they see your hand at work. Now, Lord, we come into our time of study, and I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we do that, that we would be able to lean into what your word says, and that, Father, we can set aside maybe things that we've learned growing up or things that we've leaned on for, two, for years, and let's compare that to what Scripture says, Father, and we lean into that. So, Lord, I pray that today that we would live in life, and if we find ourselves uh, drifting over into a place of darkness or a place of death, I pray, Heavenly Father, that today we would find life. And, Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In the dark and all alone, growing comfortable. Are you too scared to move and walk out of this tomb? Buried underneath the lies that you believe. Safe and sound, stuck in the ground, too lost to be found. You're just asleep, and it's time to leave. Come on and ride.
Faulty foundations cause serious problems. If the foundation is wrong, everything else will eventually fail. For a while, it's easy to ignore what's below the surface. You can believe that things at the base are fine because things you can see all look fine. But in fact, by the time tiny cracks appear in the walls of a house, the cracks in the foundation are extensive and serious. Jesus says that his words alone are a sufficient foundation. Paul tells the Corinthians that Christ alone is the only foundation upon which a life can be built. Is your life resting on a firm foundation? Open your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to look together at verses 12 through 20 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I don't know if you noticed, but your wonderful state of Alabama figured prominently in the national news media this week. Did you, did you see that? Maybe as you looked, a moment personally of very proud of. It's surrounding this issue of a law that uh, is related to in vitro fertilization. And uh, uh, I probably need to do a whole sermon on that at some point. It brings up a lot of very relevant and important issues. But the one thing that I want it to put you in mind of today is that it raised foundational issues. The issue of in vitro fertilization is technical. It, it brings in a lot of bioethical questions and, and a lot of uh, expert testimony from people with a very narrow uh, 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 focuses of knowledge like embryology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we're, what it really reveals is that we are still struggling to answer very fundamental and important foundational questions. The whole discussion around in vitro fertilization is what is the status, what is the ontolog ontological metaphysical status of an embryo? What is the embryo? Which raises the question, what is life? Which raises another question, what is a person? And we have sent people to the moon we have telecommunications that go all around the world. We have plumbed the depths of nuclear power. Uh, we uh, uh, are well-versed in quantum physics, but we still can't answer this question, what is a person? And because we can't answer questions like that, what is a person, there's a tremendous amount of confusion in our culture. But the good news this morning is the Bible answers the question, what is a person? And the Bible... Uh, brings people to life, as the song just said, and gives us the opportunity to live out real life and true life and definitional life in Christ. But this question, even what is a life? What is an embryo? What is a baby? What is the status? What does it mean to be a person? It reveals the kind of cracks that are in our culture as a result of things that are broken at the foundation. And so if you want to trace backwards to this issue where we can't even understand what a, what a person anymore is, what a, what a life is anymore, one of the places you can go uh, to find the, the fault lines is back into the sexual revolution. And what that has raised for us in so many areas is what indeed is a person. The sexual revolution has brought up the issues of, of LGBTQ, et cetera, identity. What does it really mean to be a person? What is my fundamental identity, how do I define myself? And when we became dislodged and broken off from a, a biblical understanding of that, a Judeo-Christian understanding of selfhood, why then a, a whole myriad of problems rolled out from that. We don't know who we are because we don't know whose we are. And so what we find in this current culture is this morass of confusion around what's called gender ideology. And what I started challenging you about last week is that we really do need to get down to brass tacks some of these foundational issues. And so I'm challenging you to think hard. And so once again, this morning, I hope you've taken some notes out. I hope you've got your pencil or a pen. I'm gonna give you some things that I want you to think about. Some of these concepts are gonna be a little bit hard, a little bit challenging, but they're so crucial because in the midst of this darkness, in the midst of this brokenness, 
in the midst of this confusion is a tremendous opportunity for you to give an account of the hope that's in you. People are really lost. They're really miserable and they're confused and they have no hope and they need the answers. Christians, do we have the answer? Yes, we do. And we need to be able to articulate it. But what 1 Peter chapter 3 says is we must do so with gentleness and respect. And so I'm going to talk some this morning and try to address through the use of the wisdom of God's word issues related to gender ideology, LGBT, LGBT, transgenderism, all those kinds of things. Now, how does it make you feel to know I'm talking about that? Just hearts kind of get warm and excited. No, you can feel the tension level go up. People are, feel, the, feel the nervousness about that. It, it, may, it, it may cause a, a whole array of emotions in you. And maybe this morning, you're not sure about all that sort of thing. What should be the right answer? What's the tolerant answer? And maybe there's some confusion in your own life about these things. Well, please, you're, I'm gonna preach the truth, but I always want it to be infused with grace. There's a God who loves you, has saved you. How many of you in this room this morning still battle with brokenness as a result of sin? Uh, I'm gonna do that one more time so everybody sees, everybody raise their hands. <laughs> How many of you have an ongoing challenge and battle with the brokenness of sin? Right? So everybody look around. We're all in this thing together. We're all in the same broken boat together, and we're all in need of the same solution together. So as I preach truth, please hear the grace, and we're going to give you an opportunity to lay hold of that grace in just a few moments. But as I challenged you last week, I believe that what is cracked at the foundation has to do, and here's your, here's your big word, uh, is expressive individualism. I defined that for you last week, expressive individualism. I drew this concept from Carl Truman's book, the, 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 the Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. You ought to read it. I believe it may be one of the important, most important books that, that's been written for Christians in the last three or four years. The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And it is this confusion about what it means to be a self I'm not sure from the human end of things how more basic you can get than what does it mean to be? What does it mean to be alive? What is a person? What is a self? And what has occurred in our culture starting several hundred years ago as we moved into the modern era and it's now triumphed in our culture is this. An expressive individual, expressive individualism asserts that my personal feelings are preeminent. My personal feelings determine my identity. My personal feelings determine my identity. And the world, including all of its relationships, must conform to the status of my personal feelings. That's the opposite of how it always was before. The fundamental understanding, no matter what your ultimate theology and philosophy was, is we believe that the world, the real world, was out there And the job of the human being was to figure out how to conform the in here to what was true out there. But that has been inverted. And now we rub shoulders every day with people. They might not be able to lay out the fundamentals of the the philosophy and postmodernism and Marxism and all those sorts of things. But we have been long enough in this milieu that most people, their default position is how I feel is the ultimate arbiter of truth for me. That's why a man can say, I'm really a woman trapped in a man's body. 20 years ago, that was nonsense. It's still nonsense today. Uh, But 20 years ago, that was understood as being nonsensical. That's not a thing that's not ontologically or metaphysically possible. But now that statement can be made, and all of us, even those of us who disagree with that, know what that means and feel obligated on some level to behave in concert with that as we go to work, as we send our children to school and operate in our culture. But I think there's an opportunity because that's a lie. It isn't true that our personal emotional emotions define our identity. That's not true. It's not true. It's not good. It's not beautiful. It's not good for people. It's not a good way to live. It's not a good thing for a culture to do. It's headed off a cliff. And we need to speak truth into that. And so what I want you to be able to do, and this is really what what the challenge is this morning, because we're going to go out of here on mission, and you're going to be confronted with some form of gender ideology as you go out into the world. 
And I want us to start thinking hard about how we can begin to speak truth into that. And one of the things I might want you to get good at saying is when you hear that at work, or when you're confronted with it wherever you go, is to start to begin to prepare to have a conversation that launches from this point. That view, the view of transgenderism, the view of LGBTQ identity, the view that we determine our own identity, and we really launch from that with our sexuality, which is the most pervasive and powerful of the human urges. Is are you prepared to say that's actually gender ideology based on expressive individualism? I want you to say that at some point next week, right? And see what happens, all right? At very least, it sounds smart, right? But what would it mean for you to be able to stand and say and have the courage when it's appropriate with gentleness and respect to say that's actually gender ideology based on expressive individualism? It's often sold to us as science. This is just where the science is gone. This is just what's true. You need to get on board. But see, it's all that thinking isn't scientific. It's actually religious. And expressive individualism is a ideology or a worldview, a way of thinking, a way of understanding all that is ultimate, which is not definably different from a religion. And so why should our culture choose one religion over another? It shouldn't. Right, it shouldn't but it does, and it's gonna take some of us getting informed and engaged to speak truth when the culture starts to lose its way. And that's where 1 Corinthians comes in because the Corinthians, even these Corinthian Christians, they still had the operating system of the Greeks. And that's what Paul is having to contend with is they still think and they still define the self in terms of what the Greek ideology was around them. And here's the bottom line. And here's what Paul's going to address in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Corinthians believed, even these Corinthian Christians believed, that the body is non-essential and non-determinative determinative of your identity. Let me say that again. The Corinthians believed because of their Greek philosophy that the body was secondary. The body was non-essential. It was just a, 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 a something less real than everything else to be dispensed with, thrown away. It didn't matter what you did with your body. What mattered was your spirit, and those two were separated from each other. Therefore, you get to do whatever you want with your body. That's what the Corinthians thought. That's what the Corinthian Christians thought. They could do whatever they wanted with their body because their body didn't have anything to do with their identity. That's their argument about the body. And, <laughs> and wow, these Corinthians were something. Because one of the things they thought that allowed them to do was to go uh, have sexual relations with prostitutes. They thought that was okay to be doing as Christians. Now, the Corinthians were, if you called someone a Corinthian, you were insulting them because they were, uh, had, a, had a horrific sexual ethic. But they, because of what their ideology told them, they believed that it was okay to have sexual relations with prostitutes. And what Paul is doing is he is making a body argument against that. And so what I wanna do with you this morning is I wanna take Paul's argument about the body, his instruction and truth about the body, and apply it in, to, to our modern cultural situation because modern people share the same ideology as the Greeks. This idea that the body, my body doesn't matter. It is not as important as my emotional preferences, as my emotional state. That's what's most important. And the body comes in second. And if my body or my body urges or the culture gets in the way of what I feel like I want to do, then my body has to change, my bodily expression has to change, and my culture has to change because how I feel is preeminent. How I feel is God. And so Paul makes a body argument and he's gonna help show us how we can speak that truth, that very specific truth about the body into a culture that's got everything wrong about the body and gender and what it means to be a person. And so here's your second big word, all right? The culture believes expressive individualism and I am asserting purposive relationalism. Oh yeah. Yeah. You can say, I don't believe in the gender ideology of expressive individualism. I believe in the Judeo-Christian worldview of purposive relationalism. What that means is, I believe that people are defined by their purpose. They're defined by their purpose. 
And that purpose includes relating rightly to others. Relating rightly to others. And so me fulfilling my purpose and relating rightly to others, that's what defines me. That's what makes me a me. That's what makes me a self. That's what I'm up to. And that's where meaning flows from. Well, and of course, the big question is, whose purpose? There you go. And that's the conversation we need to have. Whose purpose is, uh, uh, whose, whose purpose is, is, is normative and true? And it's time for us to have a cultural conversation about that. But I believe we need to stand up and speak to the truth, the biblical truth of purposive relationalism. All right? And that's what we're offering instead. And that's what Paul was offering instead. And so we're going to look at four things. First of all, stand with me as we honor God in the reading of his word. So that you're not here nine hours. I'm going to talk fast and you listen fast. And I promise I'm just going to give you some things that you're going to have to go off and, and think about later as we walk together into this missional opportunity, beginning in verse 12 of chapter 6. Now, this is a, it's going to start with the slogan of the Corinthians. So if you just put in quotes, the Corinthians think, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are pro- profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I won't be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and stomach is for food. That's another slogan. But God will do away with the both of them. That's part of the slogan as well. Here's Paul. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now, God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one in spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You can be seated. Four things that Paul says about the body that we can apply to this challenge of gender ideology and the challenge of expressive individualism, that the only thing that matters are my feelings. The first thing I want you to see is that the gendered body is real. The gendered body is real. One of the challenges that we're having in, in, in the culture is one of definition. What, is it, what does sex mean? What does gender mean? What does gender identity mean? What does gender expression mean? There's all this uh, rigmarole. So let me give you some definitions uh, by a, a, a man named Ryan Anderson, Princeton trained, Notre Dame uh, trained, a, a PhD there in ethics. Here are his definitions. Sex is a bodily reality. And I really wish you'd write that down. Sex is a bodily reality. The XX, XY chromosome determiner and definition of, 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 of biology. Sex is a, is a bodily reality. That means there are only males and females. Stunning I have to go over this, but I am. There are only males and females. And then gender is the social manifestation of this bodily sex. So gender is how bodily sex works itself out uh, in relationships and in the world. But that is determined by your sex. And so I'm going to use the word gender because it not only contains uh, what, uh, what it is about us physically and genetically that makes us male and female, and then how that necessarily expresses itself in the way that we live in our gender, and we are gendered. So the differences between males and females are fundamental and real and basic and determinative. The gendered body is real. The the Corinthians had a false view of the body. They thought that it was not the most real. And so eight times Paul is going to use the word soma, the Greek word for body. He wants to talk about the fact that the body is real. And it's rooted in Paul's understanding of creational goodness. From the very beginning, what God made was good. God made human beings. He made their bodies. 
And he said, they're real and they're good. And when he created them in his image, he created them male and female. The goodness of gender is the fundamental understanding of the body's contribution to our identity. And for Paul, the, the Corinthians thought that the spiritual was more important and more real than the physical, that the spiritual was more real than the body. But what Paul is saying is, is that the spiritual and the body are of the same importance. They're of the same reality. They can't be disconnected from one another, and they are the same importance to God. They have fundamental and ultimate value. Here's what expressive individualists say. My feelings are more real than anything, including others. My feelings are more real than others. Now think about that for a second. That's the assertion. That's the idea. And, here, and so here's how that works itself out. If I feel like a woman or if I don't like my body, my body and my behavior must change. Now, let me say this. Emotions are important, okay? And emotions can be, they are real indicators of real things that are going on with us. But what have you noticed about what emotions will do? They will change Okay, they'll change. The other thing that's different about emotions is, is what do these emotions mean? Well, that's a much, much, much more difficult and challenging question. And sometimes how I feel, now get ready, hold on to your hats. How I feel may not be very well attached to what's real. Have you ever had false emotions or drawn the wrong conclusions about emotions? And so emotions are real, but they change. And they have to be interpreted, and they can, they can sometimes go wrong. But the body does not change. If you're born a male, born a female, that is an ontological state that remains forever. And so why could it be assumed that I can change my identity to separate it from my body? And what we need to be prepared to do is say you can't do that. That's not a move you can make. That's not real. It's easy to get detached from reality. And it's very often good. Do you always need to have your emotions affirmed? Because that's the new view in terms of therapy when it comes to people who have gender dysphoria, which is the term we need to start using. Don't let people use transgender, if you can, nicely and respectfully, because what's going on is gender dysphoria, okay? Now, have all the, we, we ought to have tremendous compassion and love and concern for people who are battling gender dysphoria, this sense of discomfort and dislocation from their physical bodies. But they have a therapeutic need. And right now, and it's becoming, it's becoming a legal issue, is that they, those people struggling with that issue must be affirmed. And to me, it's the equivalent of saying to someone who's battling suicidal ideation, I feel suicidal. And the therapy is to affirm them no, I don't have a huge counseling background, but my seminary provided me with some. And here's what we were taught. You never affirm people's feelings, ever, no matter what their feelings are. They may come into your office and say, I am battling depression. They might be battling clinical depression. They might be struggling with something else. And there's a long, important time period of really digging down into those things, but you do not affirm. That's not good therapy. And so this whole idea that now we must affirm everybody in what their feelings tell them, especially with gender LGBTQ issues, is deeply wrong. And I think what's happening is in workplaces and in schools, we're asking the people at work and the children at schools to participate in people with gender, gender dysphoria. We're asking everyone to participate in their therapy. And this is happening in our schools. So we really want the third graders getting involved in therapy for a kid who's struggling with gender dysphoria. You want your third grader doing that? It's wrong. It's wrong for the kids. It's wrong for the kid who's struggling. It's wrong for their parents. It's wrong for the culture. It's wrong to the teacher. But that's what happens when ideology goes beyond truth. And what we've got to start saying is that's wrong to do and we're not going to do it. 
School is for learning, workplaces are for, for, for working, and if you need therapy, and everybody, I was in therapy for anxiety, okay? Therapy, good, good to go get some therapy. But you go to get therapy where, where it's appropriate, where somebody is trained and know what, knows what they're doing and can call you out of your emotional unhealth and get you back into emotional healthiness. We've got to be able to do that, and the, and the way to do that is to say, the gendered body is real. Whatever we're going to do moving forward, we can't say that it is okay to say, I'm no longer the gender of my body, because that's not possible. The body's real. Secondly, the gendered body constrains freedom. The Corinthians had a false view of the body. They had a false view of freedom. Freedom is doing whatever you want. Is freedom doing whatever you want? Is that what it means to be free? Sometimes I'm sad when I go to the zoo and I see a lion in a cage and the poor lion has been there for however long and they're kind of flea bitten and look miserable and that sort of thing. And, I, and, and sometimes you'll think, well, wouldn't it be great if we could just open that cage, let that lion out? If you let that lion out of that cage, is that lion free? Think about it. Is that lion free? He's just he's out of one mess and into another mess. When would the lion be most free? In the jungle where he was created to be and where he can live uh, at total alignment with his creational purpose. Then a lion is really free. And what is a lion created to do? Pounce and roar and claw things and roam the, the savanna and that sort of thing. And when a created being is living in alignment with his most alignment with his purpose, then he, he is most free. That's what freedom is. And that's what Paul uh, is teaching here. Uh, you didn't create yourself. You didn't make your body. Your body is the, the Lord's. It's a temple. It's created for a higher purpose. Look at Christ. Look at Christ's body. And when he lived in alignment with his purpose, he was redemptive and significant. He lived his life for others. That's when you are most free, when you are living in alignment with your purpose Expressive individual says, my gendered body is being repressed or my gendered body is repressing the free expression of who I truly am. My body is, rep is repressing me. My culture is repressing me. The people around me are repressing me. And when I could get rid of all that repression, all that constraint, then I could truly be free. But the truth is constraint is necessary for real freedom. It tells us who we are. And when you don't have any constraint, then you're everything. And the difference between being everything and being nothing is zero. It's just this confused mass. There's a difference between freedom and anarchy. There's a difference between freedom and anarchy. And when someone really means, I can't be constrained by anything. I'm gonna do whatever I want and everyone else just has to deal with it. I meet those kinds of people from time to time. There are a lot of things. Free is not one of them. And so we need to preach and teach, and Paul preaches and teaches the beauty of a godly creational restraint, constraint, so that we can truly live in alignment with what we've been purposed to be. Thirdly, the gendered body is for right relationships. The Corinthians have a false view of the body. They have a false view of freedom. Uh, they have a false view of sexual expression. They think engaging in sex outside of marriage with prostitutes is no big deal and has no consequences. And Paul flips that script. He says to them, your body and your, your use of your body and especially your sexual expression with your body couldn't be more important. It couldn't be more consequential. And when you misuse it, it was created for a real specific purpose. And when you don't use it in alignment with that purpose, there are horrible consequences as a result. Your body was made for just one other person and a covenant commitment with them. And when that sexual expression is contained there, it's glorious and it's wonderful. But when that is rejected, and you do whatever you want, believing there are no consequences. That was the promise of the sexual revolution, right? Consequence-free sex. Do whatever you want with whoever you want, whenever you feel like it, no problem. Correct? No. No. And to tell you just how pervasive this is, before I pastored here, I was in Oxford, Mississippi, and I got word that the, uh, the sorority 
uh, the Shroids were going through orientation, and one of their orientation classes was led by two lesbian women who taught all the girls that their evangelical churches had told them the wrong thing, and that they really wanted to be fulfilled, that they would have as much sex as they possibly could in as many different configurations as they possibly could with as many different people as they possibly could. And that was the path to freedom. That's not Berkeley. That's not NYU. That's not Oregon State. That's Ole Miss. And you're out of your tree if you think it's not happening at the school you love because that's how pervasive it is, and it is a lie. And we know it. The single greatest predictor of all personal and social pathologies is sex outside of marriage. Show me the people who saved themselves for marriage, and it will predict the opposite. But show me the people who were engaged in unbiblical sexual behavior. They have all the other bad things, broken relationships, health issues, physical issues, emotional issues, struggle formulating relationships, and on and on and on. It predicts poverty. It predicts lack of education. It predicts multiple marriages. On and on and on and on. It goes, it's the wrong thing to do. God has a plan for sex. And when we live within it, it's a plan for blessing. Expressive individualism says there are no consequences for what, when I do whatever I want with the body that's subsumed to my, to my particular emotional desires of the day. It couldn't be further from the truth. And then finally, we learned that the gendered body is for marriage. And that goes on to chapter seven. Paul's gonna turn his attention from the sexual immorality uh, problem to uh, a long passage on marriage, on the goodness of marriage, how to understand singleness within it. And so please hear me. When I, uh, when I talk about marriage and the goodness of marriage, there's also a, 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 a role that singleness plays. And, and, and Paul builds some of that argument. But the Corinthians have a false view of marriage. It's unnecessary. It's unimportant. It can be switched around. The chapter before, chapter five, one of their church members was in a sexual relationship with his uh, stepmother. No problem. They have a false view of marriage. It's, it's meaningless and it's, it's, it's incidental. And what Paul teaches, not only in chapter seven, but much more in Ephesians uh, five and six and Colossians 3 is the goodness and beauty of marriage, that gender and that genderedness really tells a marriage story. Your maleness suggests what you are made for in that, in that most intimate of relationships. Your femaleness suggests what you're made for. It tells you what your purpose is in that most intimate of relationships. And when that fundamental basic building block of society, a man and a woman and their children, when that has stability to it, then the whole society can be stable. stabilizes churches, stabilizes society. That's what we're made for. And when you break that down, the opposite happens. We were made for marriage. We were made for marriage. Now, the brokenness of the world sometimes doesn't make that possible for everyone, but that's the fundamental ideal for everyone is lifelong monogamy. And when you look at people like that, it predicts blessing. It predicts stability and it predicts goodness over, over a lifetime, which that's how long you're alive is a lifetime. <laughs> and so just because something works for 15 minutes or 30 minutes or eight months, you find something that works over a whole lifetime, well, you've gotten something golden and God's given it to us and your gender suggests it to you. The gender body is for marriage. But the expressive individualism says, marriage is defined by my emotions. Marriage is defined by my emotions, by how I feel. And so people, the particular arrangements, and the children that are produced out of these arrangements, all of those are secondary to how I feel now. and it doesn't work, and it isn't God's blessing for them. 
Marriage is one man and one woman for life. That's what a marriage is. I know we use the term gay marriage. That's, not, that's, that's as much not a thing as transgenderism is not a thing. Marriage requires a man and a woman in covenant relationship for life. That's what a marriage is. Other people can pretend to be married. They can do things that are marriage-like, but they are, they're, they're counterfeit. They're, they're, they're poor substitutes for God's real good purpose. And when they're engaged in the wrong way, they tend to make things worse, not better. And so we stand as people who, who want to raise up and lift up the ideal, what's best, the ideal, what's best for human beings in their sexual relationship is to be, is to be married. That's why I'm thrilled that in our, in our state and in our schools, I've been able to go and teach, can't use the Bible, but we teach the biblical view of marriage. We teach abstinence and, and monogamy, and we put that before kids. Because you see, it's, it's the wrong thing to do. And this isn't religiously wrong. This is just morally wrong. It's morally wrong to teach third graders about uh, Billy's two dads. Don't, don't, don't teach little ones that. First of all, Billy doesn't have two dads. Billy has one dad. And then this other guy that's around. That's not two dads. And we're not made to have two dads. We're made to have a dad and a mom. That's how that works. Now, again, the brokenness of the world goofs that up. And I'm going to talk in just a second about grace. But we don't need to lie to the children. It's always wrong to lie to children. So I say we lift up before them an ideal. That it's for their blessing and for their good. And all this circles to the fact, as Paul points out all the way through, that all of these things that are our true purposes ultimately made possible and full and real in Christ alone. And so I've told you a lot of truth. Let me hit you with the grace that is, that, that is the runway to Paul's instruction. If you'll look at verse nine, look at verse nine of chapter six, the little passage just before the passage we focused on. Paul says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Ooh, those are tough words. Then, hallelujah, verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit of of our God, hallelujah. A way of forgiveness and wholeness and newness, a way for things to be redeemed. And Paul didn't think for one moment that these Corinthians were anything other than the precious blood-bought objects of God's salvific affection. And all God wants and all Paul wants is the best, best, best for them. And that can always and only truly completely happen through trusting Jesus as your Lord. So I don't know what your sexual brokenness is today or your brokenness in other areas. All of us are broken. All of us are broken. And all of us cannot be cleaned up and renewed without trusting Christ as Savior. And then what he has for us, the such were some of us, is something exceedingly abundantly beyond what we could ask or think. And no matter how messed up you think you are, how far you've gone, how many mistakes you've made, how far you are from this standard, so was I. And Jesus found me. So were all of us. And Jesus found us. And Jesus will find you today, right now. In fact, his cross has demonstrated how badly he wants to meet you forgive you, change you, save you, fill you with new and lasting power and set your life in a completely new direction. And all you have to do is say, yes. Will you bow your heads with me? God, we want to be people of the truth because, oh God, lies are from the devil and they are death dealing and they are intended to kill and steal and destroy. And we help no one. 
by not being people of the truth. God, help us as your people to be people of the truth. Oh, but Jesus, you are more than that. You are more than full of truth. You are full of grace too. A perfect, beautiful infusion of the fullness of both of those things, full of both grace and truth. And so, God, as we affirm the truthfulness of your word, we affirm the gracefulness of your word as well. God, help us to make sure that we are, we, we, first of all, that we are in need of that kind of grace. And so, God, we together are willing to take a look at our own lives, our own sexual ethic, our own behavior. We're gonna, right now, God, I pray that we can take a look at the things we're watching, the things that we're listening to, the things that we give tacit approval to, because we put up with it, we set it before our eyes. It's displeasing to you. And so God, in our own, each one of us in our own lives, we, we pray for your forgiveness, your renewal, and, and your call to personal holiness. God, I, I, I pray for uh, uh, people who need to take the next step today of, of church membership. It'd be an odd day to join this church. But God, I pray that that they'll join today because they know that this is a place where truth and grace is preached and, and shared. And it's the heart of our mission, imperfect though we are. So God, call people to connect with this body. And God, then finally, I pray for the person who's walking in, in brokenness, who bought into the lies of the world, bought, bought, bought into the philosophies of the world and, and reaped the consequences for it. God, would you call them call others to a saving relationship with you through Christ alone. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Pastor Scott's going to lead us, and as we sing this morning, would you come as we sing together? Come. can be seated. Let us share some things with you about what's coming up in the life of our church. Good morning. I'm Blythe. Thank you, Pastor Eric, for this series on foundations. This is the most critical element of a believer's walk. One of the core values for our church is to help those in need. Next Sunday, March 3rd, is Compassion Sunday here at First Fairhope. Here's a quick video we'd like to share with you.
Compassion Sunday, people of all ages may select a child to sponsor. Be praying about your involvement in this. First Hope helps so many people right here in Fairhope with life-sustaining needs. Next week, Chef Bill will be preparing a great lunch for you. It's a lunch to go and will benefit our First Hope ministry. So make plans to not cook lunch next Sunday, but to sign up for a lunch to go. I hope you'll be headed to Bible study next. If you're not sure where to go, head to the welcome desk in the gathering space and people will be there to help you. If this is your first time here, that's where you'll pick up your free gift. Thanks for being here today. See you in Bible study. Well, thank you so much for being in worship with me today. It's always a tremendous encouragement to me to sing praises and to dive into God's word uh, with you. Uh, if this message this morning challenged you and you need to talk some more about it, I'm going to hang around after the worship service is over. Uh, I want to pastor and shepherd you well. And so if you have a need that you think I can meet, please let me know. Uh, I want to be the hands and feet of Christ uh, to you uh, as I'm able. Hope you'll be here next week for Compassion Sunday. Always a great Sunday in the life of our church. Have a great testimony from, a, uh, uh, from one of the uh, kids that Compassion has reached uh, that experienced t- total and complete life change. And, and we'll be delving into the fundamental truth that we always do what's best for children. As kingdom people, we always do what's best for children. So it's going to be a great time of worship next week. Greg Carruthers is going to come, one of our wonderful deacons, uh, and he is going to dismiss us in prayer. Y'all have a great time uh, in Bible study. Would you please stand? Thank you. Father, we thank you for the truth preached so clearly today. On the foundation built on truth in the Jesus Christ. Thank you for Frank being baptized today. Thank you for your faithfulness and how you blessed us. There's joy in the house of the Lord. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.